Hi everyone, my name is Shai Reshef and I'm very happy to have another session today with a great guest, George Rapp. But before I start, just to remind you that if you like what you see, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. And here we are uh, with George Rapp, uh, one of the leaders in higher education with an amazing career and a lot of achievements. And I think that instead of introducing you and telling about all your achievements and all those amazing things that you did through your uh, life, which will probably it will take the entire time, I will let you tell us what brought you up to, up to these days. Well, I would actually much more enjoy listening to you talk about me for 15 or 20 minutes. But I, as long as we, I've agreed, we, I would also speak. I will, I will be glad to start with a little bit about my background. Uh, my parents were both immigrants. Neither of them had been to universities. Um, they, to show you how strange life is, my father uh, immigrated in 1930. He had decided that there really wasn't much of a future in, in, in South Germany, in the Black Forest where he lived, and things would be better in New York. And so he landed right at the peak of the onset of the Depression and started out sweeping floors and, and doing whatever, uh, whatever he could to earn a little bit of money. Um, roomed with a, another uh, immigrant from Germany, and through that person met my mother when he went back to Germany the first time in 1936 to visit his family and I also visited his uh, his roommate's family and then my mother um, met him and they sort of worked out a deal where she could come over and be a child care uh, person uh, and then and a few years later married. So I, I grew up with two immigrant parents. Um, I was never unemployed from age nine on. And I um, also very early on was, very, was interested in international connections. For example, when I was in my junior year in college, I went to Germany for my junior year. I, I learned German before I learned English. So it was easy for me to, to study there, but I basically met two branches, uh, two halves of my personality in my parents' very different uh, geographical and, and family uh, connections. And that was a terrific experience. I, I, I felt as if I, well, when I left for my junior year, my mother said as I left, when you meet your father's family, you will understand him for the first time which was true. I had had a lot of tension with my father and suddenly it all became quite clear why he was the way he was. And I was uh, delighted to learn a little bit more about where I came from. But it also, I have to say, fundamentally confirmed my sense that I was an American. I could, could never become a German or had no interest in becoming a German. But I also learned what it's like to be in, in very different cultures, very different societies. And, and since then, I've been involved in education and in international relief and development, but always with a sense of the importance of being able to understand more than one culture at a time. That's fascinating. And, you know, understanding where you came from actually explain a lot of that, uh, a lot of what uh, you have done later on. But let me make a jump to uh, Colombia. And you were the president of Columbia University for many years. And how would you describe your period there? What, what, what do you feel is your, what did you take from that? And what is the main thing that you feel that was your main effect on that institution? Well, Columbia was in a fairly um, tough situation when I went. There's a substantial deficit. There'd been a vote of no confidence in my predecessor. And so there was a lot of building to do. But I early on decided I would have uh, three priorities. One is to strengthen the core of Columbia, which I thought was its emphasis on the core curriculum and its undergraduate education, which had not been emphasized very much. 
And so I put that into much higher salience in terms of our fundraising and all of our other activities. The second priority was to improve the relationships between Columbia and our neighboring communities, uh, in particular Morningside Heights, Harlem, Washington Heights, where we, the, Columbia was a very important presence. And I worked very hard at that, and I think we made some real solid progress. And the third priority was to continue the, and enhance the international profile that Columbia had by developing further connections to other parts of the, of the, of the world. Um, so, emphasize the heart of Columbia as undergraduate education, which had not been done uh, in recent in the recent history of it. Second, connect to the broader uh, community around Columbia and also New York City as a whole. And third, continue to raise the profile of Columbia as a global institution. It's very interesting. Very interesting because from there you went to IRC, the International um, Rescue Committee, uh, which is very different on the one hand, on the one hand, but on the other hand, when you when thinking about it, it brings you back to your history, being uh, a son of, uh, of two immigrants and refugees uh, are definitely a large part of it. How do you summarize your, your period there? Well, I think you're correct. The IRC, when I decided to, to leave for Columbia uh, or resign from the presidency, the board tried to convince me to stay in all kinds of ways. And I finally said, you know, um, we have just finished a capital campaign. We raised $2.8 billion, which then was a record for universities. Uh, it, since then has been surpassed. And we have lots of progress in our connections to the our neighboring communities in New York City as a whole, and we've made substantial gains in our, our profile internationally. And this is the time then to look for the, my successor so that if he or she takes a couple of years in order to get to know the community and get set new priorities, um, we are not losing all too much time. I said, you know, Harvard can afford to lose five years in, in, in transitions. Columbia can't. We have to keep the momentum going. And finally, everyone agreed, OK, he's going to go. And I also was very, very aware that I had one, what I thought was one career left. I was just turning 60, and that means I could you know, be a significant leader in another institution. And I started out once it was public that I was going to, I didn't want to look for another job while I, before people knew that I was, you know, finishing up at Columbia on good terms, but I was nonetheless finishing. And I still remember I, I had interviews with lots of colleagues and mentors. I remember a dinner or a luncheon I had with, uh, with um, Bowen, the former president of Princeton and then the head of the Mellon Foundation. And he was very direct in saying, you know, George, I don't know what you're going to wind up doing, but the only organization I can think of that has the kind of combination of, I, I was very interested in international development for reasons I'll explain in a minute. The only organization I can think of that is really first class and does what you, uh, what you have said is your interest is in an outfit called the International Rescue Committee. Now they happen to just have a president, they're very happy with him, but you ought to look for other organizations that are similar to, to that. And so I said, thank you very much, Bob, I will do that. And I did some research. And then about three months later, the, the president, of, or the chair of the board of Columbia called me up and said, you know, I, I, I'm sorry to intrude on you, but I think you might be, uh, it might be worth my doing so because uh, I understand that you might be interested in international relief and development. And I, I happen to be involved with the International Rescue Committee. And, and so I, then I told him this story that I, of, of the discussion that I had had. And he said, well, my, my wife is the chair of the board of the chair of the select, selection committee. So maybe you can talk to her and then we'll see what happens. That was Catherine Farley, the, the chair of the board who called me as Jerry Spire. Um, and one thing, the this IRC staff were a little skeptical, you know, what's academic, he's never really done development work, but we it, we sort of sorted it out and it seemed to make sense. And it was, I, I think, just a wonderful opportunity for me. 
Now, the connections to my earlier life are not only that my parents were immigrants and that I grew up really in an immigrant community, and not only that I spent a year in Germany studying there and, and subsequently a year in, in, on a sabbatical, but I also had spent a year during my graduate studies in Sri Lanka, in what was then known as Ceylon, studying Theravada Buddhism, which I was fascinated with. And so I had a sense of, of what the potential was for development and in, 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 in for um, get, uh, raising people's uh, capacities in, in the developing world. And that's part of, I also had two daughters who were anthropologists, one of them spending many years in Africa, uh, in West Africa. So I had a bunch of reasons why I thought it would be interesting to go and, and work in a, in a development uh, setting. Uh, and and uh, I had basically enjoyed higher education, but I never enjoyed any work as much as I did uh, the International Rescue Committee. I, as I used to say to people, I, I, when I was a head of universities, I, I would go to centers of high culture where there were prosperous alums and try to get money from them. And now I'm going to all the other interesting places in the world. <laughs> and I thought, you know, Six trips to Afghanistan, six trips to Con the Democratic Republic of Congo, five or six trips to Sudan, uh, not to mention single trips to any place, as I used to say, any place where shit happens, the IRC is there. And it was always terrific because I would go not as an outsider, but as a colleague of people who were there. Now, when I left the IRC, it had tripled in size during my 11 years that I was there. But it, when I left, there were 12,000 employees, 12,000 employees of, of, of the IRC. 97% of them were locals. So I, I would go to, to DRC, and I wouldn't be hosted by a bunch of people from New York. I'd be hosted by a, a, the vast majority of our co colleagues were themselves from the DRC. And it was a, just a wonderful experience. And I think the IRC did a wonderful job in community development in those countries. And then also in resettling refugees in this country, which was its original uh, mandate when, when yeah. it was founded by Albert Einstein. Talking about, well, we're getting closer to University of the People. We started with Colombia, and now we're talking about, about refugees. But your next stop was with the International Baccalaureate. So, you know, which is purely international by definition. Um, how was that? <laughs> well, I, I enjoy, I think the IB is a wonderful organization. Uh, I had only known it, again, it's one of these connections, as with the connection to the IRC, only known it because our older daughter, who spent her junior year in Germany, ironically, um, had gone back to Houston. I was, we were then, I was then president of, of Rice University and had um, been in this, the magnet school for, for language study because uh, she was a very accomplished uh, person in languages. And their other students were in the International Baccalaureate. She couldn't be because she was only there in that program for one year when she came back from, from being abroad. But I, as a result, I knew the IB and I remember once mentioning to the person who was the chair of the board at Hedrick and Struggles, which was a search firm that the, that the International Baccalaureate was using, I had mentioned to him, Tracy Wollstonecroft is his name, um, that, that I had, we just discussed the IB, that he, he and his wife had adopted a couple of uh, ch children from China and they were in the IB program and he was all excited about it. And I mentioned this one connection, namely my older daughter had been in school that had the IB as an option, though she wasn't able to take it. And he remembered that. And so when they got this search, they, he said, this is a long shot, but why don't we just talk to Robert? He might be able to be interested in it. And of course they were suspicious. I had no real connections to the IB and so on. My predecessor was Carol Bellamy, who had been you know, very prominent in both international affairs and in New York politics. Um, but anyway, it, it worked out and I wound up going there. And one of my priorities when I went there was that the IB do more work with less than elite schools, populations, countries. And that's why I'm so excited about the ways in which we're working with the University of the People, because uh, my concern was that we 
we make the resources, first rate intellectual resources that the IB represented available uh, to, in particular to students, prospective students in Africa. And the master's program that we do, that we have a partnership with the University of the People in, is just a wonderful illustration of the way in which the University of the People is able to support this kind of global outreach and allow opportunities for people who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunities. And so I'm very excited that the Masters of Education, Education program is a joint one. I'm excited that the UOP is it really boomed to 65,000 students, but I'm really especially interested that there are 3,000 students in this Masters of Education program, and 550 of them are in Africa. So that the, right. our, we, 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 the UOP, is doing exactly what the IRC knows is necessary, what the IRC and the IB know is necessary, namely training outstanding teachers who are conversant with global education and can prepare students to be teaching in IB programs in Africa. And I'm very excited about that. I don't mean that's all I'm excited about in the IB, but that's really a great achievement. I think I, I agree with you. And, I, and you know, when we, um, for those who do not know, uh, University of the People has a master in education in collaboration with the IB and we adopt uh, the IB pedagogy and develop together with the IB a master in education, which is an amazing program. We have a lot of students. It's our fastest growing program. We have students from all over the world growing a number of students, as, as George just mentioned, from Africa. The IB gives scholarships for students in Africa. And we believe that uh, when you look at the world, and you know, that's, that is actually connected to everything that you were talking about, um, Africa needs better, better education system. And as educator and as a university, we should help making it happen. And whether it is for, for, for a citizen, who live in those countries and whether it is for refugees. By the way, again, to connect to the IRC, University of the People have over 6,000 refugees, which is more than any university in the world. So actually our our roads are closed in so many, many ways. And uh, for those who do not know, uh, George is a member of University of the People President's Council. And I, I you know, just listening to everything that you have done in your life and, and the way you, you look at things, uh, no doubt that uh, you are one of our leaders and lead us to, um, to go further and the uh, importance that we put on opening the gates to higher education for everyone, especially those who deserve it. And refugees are obviously those who deserve it most and need the opportunity in order to improve their life and hopefully get out of the situation where, where they are in. Uh, that's what we are, and, and that's what you are, and, and thank you for <laughs> everything that you're doing for us. Well, thank you very much for developing that program, and I, I agree, it's been a wonderful opportunity for the IB, not just for UOP, but it's a very good partnership, and I think it's very important for the goals of both organizations. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and uh, when we're talking to them, the feeling is that it's a win-win situation. And, you know, I believe that every partnership should be a win-win situation. So from your vast experience, what advice can you give our students? Well, I, I think for that, I will go back to the very first um, position I had after getting my PhD. It was in Johnston College, an experimental college in California, it's now it's part of the University of Redlands in Redlands, California. And it was a wonderful place. It had, it had no grades, no general graduation requirements, no faculty ranks and no departments and so on. But, but it was the education key was that students had to work with advice, faculty advisors to develop their individual graduation plans that they needed to follow through and, and complete. And I would urge UOP students, think of yourself as developing your own overall graduation plan. You obviously have to take courses that are available, but, but figuring out how to structure your own program and then following through on it 
is a more effective way of being educated than just taking required courses and the rest of it. And so look up Johnston College and the University of Redlands if you want to if you want to see a way that, of doing that with individual learning contracts or maybe go to the Johnston College and the University of Redlands after you finish your first couple of years in the UOP program. But in any case, uh, design your own program and stick to it so that you wind up doing what you want to do rather than what someone else wants you to do. That's, that's a wise uh, advice. I would add to it and don't give up. That's another thing that our students I, should, should uh, make sure because for many of them, those that you describe, those that you met and help along your life, many of them need the help and a lot of uh, willpower in order to complete the education. Well, thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Really, it was a great pleasure. And uh, again, uh, like this video, subscribe to our channel so more people will hear about us and enjoy the wisdom that uh, I heard and you heard uh, in the last uh, half an hour. Thanks, George, and uh, good luck. Thank you, Shai. Take care. And keep Thank up you. the good work. Thank you. We're trying. We're trying. Thanks.